Hello, everyone. We have just concluded three wonderful sessions of the CHEM camp organized by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information Core Curriculum Unit. This new production is a series of short videos geared at answering key past paper questions based on CXC guidelines. But first, a word of prayer from one of our students sitting CXC chemistry this year. Dear righteous and heavenly Father, we come before you today. We come before you right now to give you glory, honor, and praise because without you, we would not be here. We want to thank you, God, that we are alive and well. Lord, I want to thank you for the MOE. I want to thank you, God, for tapping into their spirits and their hearts, for allowing them to do the chemical revision sessions so that students will be able to understand, so that they'll be able to to pass their examinations. I pray, oh God, that you touch the student's mind, body, and spirit right now, God. Give them the strength to keep pushing. Lord God, Jesus, let them know that you have not given them a spirit of fear, but of love, power and of a sound mind. I pray, O God, that they shall know that they can overcome. You were told them in the Bible, O God, that they are overcomers, that they can conquer this. So, Lord, I pray, O God, that you be with them. Order their steps in your mighty name, Jesus. I pray for the teachers, as this is a very challenging time. I pray, O God, that you shall be with them. They have to be adapting to technology. And I pray, God, that you shall help them to find a way so they so they can connect with students in the classrooms. Lord God, Jesus, I pray for success. I pray for victory. We're speaking it into existence right now, God. We're manifesting it in your mighty name that the children shall do exceptionally well. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise. As without you, God, this would not be possible. So, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for everything that you're about to do in your holy and mighty name we pray amen thank you summer and we wish you and all the other students all the best in your exams i'd like to extend welcome to all our students teachers and parents who may view this presentation i would like to express thanks to dr taylor campbell who conceptualized the series that has already proven to be of tremendous benefit to all our students. Thanks must also be expressed to the chemistry master teachers of the Jamaica Teaching Council who ran the Chem Camp. Look out for part two. And thanks to all the teachers of the Association of Science Teachers of Jamaica for their encouragement, participation, and support. I will now hand over to Dr. Taylor Campbell to guide you through the order and arrangement of the segments. All the best for your examinations 2021. Welcome students to this or CSEC chemistry camp series. And in this particular resource, we'll be taking you through a number of examination questions targeting topics that have been indicated by CXC. Of course, Master Elaine Williams would have welcomed us earlier. And I just wanna say thanks to her and other members of the Association of Science Teachers who have supported this initiative so far. So in this video, we'll be looking at questions geared towards answering the paper two topics. And so we'll be helping you to interpret the questions, um, providing you with some tips on how to answer the questions, and of course, providing solutions to the respective questions. Our first video will be done by Ms. Kimon Sinclair on the topic, acids, bases, and salts. So get your pencils and pens and have a productive session, students. Hi, everyone. Today we will be looking at a chemistry paper two question on acid, base, and salt. The question reads, sulfuric acid can react with sodium hydroxide to form a normal salt and an acid salt. Define an acid. 
distinguish between a normal salt and an acid salt. Write a balance equation for the formation of normal and an acid salt when sulfuric acid reacts with aqueous sodium hydroxide. Epsom salt is commonly found in many household cabinets. It is composed of hydrated magnesium sulfate. Give two uses of Epsom salt. What does the term hydrated mean in hydrated magnesium sulfate? And your teacher asks you to prepare a pure dry sample of anhydrous magnesium sulfate in the laboratory, starting with magnesium carbonate. Outline the procedure you will use. So the first question asks to define an acid. Now an acid can be defined two ways. It can be defined as a substance that reacts with a base to produce salt and water. Or it can also be defined as a proton donor because it contains hydrogen ions. Distinguish between a normal salt and an acid salt. Now remember, a salt is a substance that is formed when some or all of the hydrogen ions in an acid are replaced by a metal or ammonium ion. So, a normal salt is a compound formed when all of the hydrogen ions in an acid are replaced by metal or ammonium ions. Therefore, an acid salt is a compound which is formed when the hydrogen ions in an acid are partially replaced by a metal or ammonium ion. Write a balance equation for the formation of normal and an acid salt when sulfuric acid reacts with aqueous sodium hydroxide. Now remember, the formula for sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Therefore, it can form a normal salt where all the hydrogen ions are replaced and an acid salt where only one of the hydrogen ions will be replaced. So, the equation for the normal salt would be 2NaOH aqueous plus H2SO4 aqueous, which will give us Na2SO4 aqueous plus 2H2O liquid. Always remember to balance your equation. For the, the acid salt, remember we said only one hydrogen will be replaced here. So the formula would be, or the equation would be, NaOH aqueous plus H2SO4 aqueous gives us NaHSO4 aqueous plus H2O liquid. And that would be the acid salt, the NaHSO4. Epsom salt is commonly found in many household cabinets. It is composed of hydrated magnesium sulfate, which is MgSO4.7H2O. Give two uses of Epsom salt. So Epsom salt can be used in agriculture and it can be also used in various medicinal purposes such as used for aches and pains. What does the term hydrated mean in hydrated magnesium sulfate? The term hydrated mean it is a crystalline salt molecule which contains water of crystallization. So that seven molecules of water that is present there is the water of crystallization. Now, your teacher asks you to prepare a pure dry sample of anhydrous magnesium sulfate in the laboratory, starting with magnesium carbonate. Outline the procedure you will use. So, the first thing you need to decide is, is the salt soluble or insoluble? If it is insoluble, it means that you would use an precipitation. If it is soluble, now you need to determine is the salt a potassium, sodium, or ammonium salt. The salt is not insoluble because we have tried to prepare magnesium sulfate, and magnesium sulfate is a soluble salt. So we already have ruled out the insoluble salt being an precipitation. So now we need to figure out is the salt a potassium, sodium, or ammonium salt? If yes, 
we would use titration. If no, then we continue. It is not a potassium sodium or ammonium salt, so we cannot use titration. No, so now we need to figure out, is the salt an anhydrous chloride? No, it is not an anhydrous chloride, so we cannot use direct combination. So what we need to use is a reactive metal, insoluble base or an insoluble carbonate with an acid. So it said that we're starting with magnesium carbonate. So we already have our carbonate. Now we need to decide which acid we're going to react it with to produce the salt of magnesium sulfate. So the magnesium will come from the magnesium carbonate. Where will the sulfate come from? So you can use sulfuric acid. So we are going to be reacting magnesium carbonate and sulfuric acid. So these are the steps that you would have. You would add the magnesium carbonate to the sulfuric acid in excess until effervescence stops. You do this because you want all the acid to react. You then dip a blue litmus paper in the solution to test to see if all the acid is reacted. If it remains blue, it means that there's no more acid present. You can continue with your steps. The next step is to filter the solution to remove the excess carbonate and collect the filtrate. So the filtrate contains your magnesium sulfate salt. Now you're go you remember you want an anhydrous magnesium sulfate. Anhydrous means that it will contain no water. So what you need to then do is evaporate the water and then you leave the anhydrous magnesium sulfate to dry and that would be your steps in preparing your anhydrous magnesium sulfate. We will continue our camp by looking at qualitative analysis, which usually requires some knowledge of acids, bases and salts that was covered earlier. Now this is the question that we were given. We're told that we're conducting some tests on solid mixture X and note in section A that describes us mixing solid mixture X to form mixing with water and filtering the mixture to form a filtrate and a residue. Now the filtrate is used in separate um, portions for test B to D while the residue is used in test E. So note in this case, the section for A, for observation and inferences are blocked, so we would not write in those sections. And we're told now to fill in the observations to complete the table given certain inferences that are made. So let's look at the part B. We're told that chloride ions are present, and let's note the reagents used. We have added dilute nitric acid to a portion of the filtrate and follow that by a few drops of silver nitrate solution and then ammonium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia is added to the resulting mixture. So we're, we're, we're required to give three observations. Personally, I think this only requires two observations. However, we can look each time we add a reagent, we can write an observation to match. So when we add a dilute nitric acid, we'd probably not see any observable change to the filtrate However, on adding silver nitrate, if chloride ions are present, we would now have a white precipitate. And of course, adding aqueous ammonia is to determine whether the precipitate dissolves or not. So if chloride ions are present, the precipitate would dissolve in aqueous ammonia. In the second part of the test, we're now adding potassium iodide part C to another portion of solution X, the filtrate. And in the inference, we're told that an oxidizing agent is present. Now, usually potassium iodide would be acting as a reducing agent. So if an oxidizing agent is present to um, react with our potassium iodide, 
what we would observe is that a color change. So iodide is colorless and when it reacts, it would change from colorless to brown. And that would be our observation. In part D, to another portion of the filtrate, we're adding sodium hydroxide and we're adding until it is in excess. So we need two observations for that particular test. And in the inference, we're told and three ands are present. So usually it's very easy to, um, to identify our transition metal ands because they're usually colored. So and three ands is a particular color. So when we add sodium hydroxide, we would expect to get a reddish brown precipitate and we're noting now whether the precipitate dissolves or remains when the sodium hydroxide is added in excess. And for and three ands, the precipitate would be insoluble in excess. And in the final part of this particular test, we're now adding nitric acid to the residue. So remember we had separated the substance um, into the residue and the filtrate. And when we add nitric acid and test the gas produced, we would have passed it through lime water. So that's the test. And the inference is that carbonate ions are present. So normally, how do we know that carbonate ions are present or they are confirmed? So again, we take each reagent um, stepwise. So when we add dilute nitric acid to the residue, we would expect to see fizzing or effervescence. That's the observation. And the gas produced when we pass it through lime water, the lime water would become cloudy or milky, or we would we could write that we got a white precipitate. And of course, if we continue to bubble the gas through the lime water, eventually that white precipitate would dissolve, and that would confirm the presence of carbonate ions. Good job. Now we have a second test that is done on aqueous solution of compound Z. And again, we're given the inferences and asked to fill out the table with the observations. So let's look carefully. For part A, we're given a sample of solution Z, right? Dilute nitric acid was added, followed by a few drops of silver nitrate. So it's very important to look at the reagents we're adding and the inference made. Normally, when we're adding silver nitrate solution, we're checking for the presence of halide ions. And so in this particular inference, we're told that no chloride, bromide, or iodide ions are formed. So that would mean that in our observation, there would have been no reaction or no observable reaction when the silver nitrate was added. Part B now, we're told that to that sample solution of Z, we are adding a few copper turnings and following that by adding concentrated sulfuric acid and we know that in our inference we're told that definitely nitrate ions are present how do we confirm the presence of nitrate ions by using these reagents so normally many of these anions would produce a particular gas in this case nitrate ions being present means that the gas nitrogen dioxide would have been produced and so in our observation nitrogen dioxide has a characteristic color so we could see brown fumes of nitrogen dioxide and it is also a pungent gas and because the solution the copper is in a sulfuric acid solution another observation could be that the solution became blue Now the test continues to another sample of solution Z. We're adding aqueous sodium hydroxide and we're adding it until it is in excess. So we need two observations for that test. And we note that we're told that zinc or lead is possibly present. I think the I minus is a, is a mistake. It should have been something else. So for that to happen, for us to have either zinc or lead present when we add sodium hydroxide, we should get a white precipitate and, and in both cases for zinc and lead, that white precipitate would be soluble in excess or we could say the precipitate dissolves. Now in the next step, in the next test, we know that the zinc two ions are confirmed. 
So to a sample of solution Z, part D, adding aqueous ammonia and adding it in excess, again, two observations needed to confirm the presence of zinc 2 plus ions. So if zinc 2 plus ions are present, we get a white precipitate for us to confirm it when we add in excess the zinc ions, the precipitate would dissolve or would be soluble in excess, whereas if we had lead ions, then it would have been insoluble in excess. So the fact that it's soluble in excess confirms the presence of zinc 2 plus. And the final part of this particular test to a sample of solution Z, we're adding a few drops of acidified aqueous potassium manganate 7 and heating that solution. And we note in the inference, it says that Z is not a reducing agent. So if Z is a reducing agent, we would see that our potassium permanganate would change color. But the fact that it's not a reducing agent would mean that potassium manganate did not change color. And so what we would observe is that the potassium manganate solution remained purple. And that would be your observation. And the final part of this question, to a sample of solution Z, we're adding the reagents barium chloride followed by dilute hydrochloric acid. And normally when we're adding these substances, we're check che checking for the presence of sulfate, sulfite, or carbonate ions. In this case, the inference says sulfate ions are definitely present. And so when we add our barium solution, we would see a white precipitate. To eliminate all the other ions, it means therefore that that white precipitate um, did not dissolve when we added hydrochloric acid. And so the precipitate remained, and that would confirm the presence of sulfate ions. Good job, students. I hope you have been finding the questions useful so far. Our next video will be covering the topic rates of reactions, which will appear on the alternative paper, paper three. Hello there, I'm Mrs. E. Will. I'm on my way to the chem lab. Let's see how long it will take me to get there. Hello. Welcome. Actually, I'm in my kitchen at home because of COVID-19. Our topic for today is rates of reaction. We'll be looking at a May-June 2010 paper, data analysis for 25 marks and the time is 30 minutes. Tip number one. Read through the entire question before starting to write. Identify the main topic or topics. Identify the parts that are just for information and the questions to be answered. Identify the number of marks for each subsection as a guide to know how much information is required. Our question is about the catalytic decomposition of hydrogen peroxide Jonathan carried out an experiment at room temperature and pressure, and so did Karen. Figure 1 below shows a graph of the data obtained by Karen. Table 1 shows the results of Jonathan's experiment. Figure 2 is a diagram of the enthalpy change for an exothermic reaction, showing the effect of the catalyst on the reaction pathway. Our first question is to identify the parts labeled A to D for four marks and to write a balanced equation for two marks. Then we are to plot the remaining points on the graph, compare the plots obtained from Jonathan's and Karen's results 
in terms of the slope of the graph, the volume of oxygen produced, and to account for the differences in their results. Using Karen's graph, we have to determine the volume of oxygen produced in 45 seconds and then calculate the number of moles of that oxygen. Calculate the initial rate of the reaction for three miles. You are required to plan and design an experiment to compare the effects of the catalysts manganese 4 oxide and catalase on the rate of decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Draw a clearly labeled diagram of a suitable experimental arrangement for carrying out the investigation in the lab. State two variables that should be controlled, two limitations, and one precaution. That's four marks, giving a total of 25 marks. Number two, now that we have looked at the question, let's get started. And so A, we see starts from reactants with that little hill. We know it is activation energy. B, with a lower rise, we know is activation energy with catalyst. C shows the energy between the reactants and products. And we know that is the heat of reaction. And D is on the line showing us products. Now we have to write a balanced equation to show the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide by manganese 4 oxide. Tip number three. When writing properly balanced equations, first write the reactants, then the reaction arrow, then the products, then the state symbols. Information is usually given in the question. So we look at the question and we see decomposition of hydrogen peroxide using manganese 4 oxide as catalyst, going to measure oxygen given off, and water is also produced. We notice that there's 100 ml of two different hydrogen peroxide solutions, varying concentration. Tip number four. Catalysts speed up the reaction by lowering the activation energy but not taking part in the reaction. Catalysts are not usually written as reactants in the equation. Catalysts can be written over the arrow or simply left out of the equation. So here we have hydrogen peroxide giving us oxygen and water. Hydrogen peroxide is aqueous, oxygen a gas, and water a liquid. Tip number five. Balance the number of each element from left to right. You may also go from right to left. Fractions can be used, then multiply by the denominator to get whole numbers. Looking from left to right, we had two oxygens and three on the right. So we put a half where we have oxygen as the only substance so it does not affect the hydrogen multiplying everything by the denominator which is two gives us, us two hydrogen peroxide plus oxygen to give us two moles of water on the left we have four ox oxygens on the right four on the left four hydrogens on the right four now we have to plot the graph using the volumes given of oxygen. Tip number six. When plotting a graph, identify the scale on each axis by looking at the main intervals and dividing by the number of parts. Try to plot as accurately as possible. Look at the general trend of the points and draw the best straight line or curve that may not necessarily run through each point. Now we are to compare the plots obtained from Jonathan's and Karen's results in terms of the slope of the graph, the volume of oxygen, and account for the differences between their results. Tip number seven. Do not describe the points where the plots are, but look at the general shape of both curves, trend in steepness of the slopes, and end values of both. 
And so number one, Jonathan's experiment had a steeper slope than Karen's, meaning that the time taken for gas production was less than Karen's. That's a faster rate. Two, the volume of gas produced by Jonathan's experiment was greater at 23 cm cubed than Karen's at 16.5 cm cubed. The reason Jonathan's experiment went faster and produced more carbon dioxide was the concentration of 0.8 moles per dm cube was double that of Karen's experiment at 0.4 moles per dm cube. Now using Karen's graph, we're gonna look at the volume of oxygen produced in 45 seconds. And we go to 45 and we see that the volume is eight. Eight cm cube. The number of moles of oxygen produced, and we are given the information that one mole of gas occupies 24 dm cube at room temperature and pressure. Tip number eight. To determine which equation to use to find the moles, look at the knowns and the unknowns. You are asked to find the volume of gas at room temperature and pressure from the, gra the graph, then determine the number of moles. With the information given, the volume equation at RTP should be used and not the concentration of hydrogen peroxide solution. So the number of moles is equal to volume of gas divided by 24 dm cube at RTP. Tip number nine, substitute the numbers into the equation correctly. Calculate the correct numbers. Write your units. Make sure they are the same. Write your answer in standard form, usually to two decimal places. And so we see that we can either convert cm cube to dm cube or dm cube to cm cube. It is easier to multiply 24 dm cube by 1000 to give us 24,000 cm cube. And after calculating, we get our answer of 3.3 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. Calculate the initial rate of Jonathan's reaction. We're going to use the gradient of the slope nearest the start of the reaction and the gradient is a difference in the y value divided by the difference in the x value so we look back at our graph and see that our gradient on the left is 16 divided by 60 0 0.2 cm cube per second now we're required to plan and design and draw a properly labeled diagram of a suitable experiment arrangement of this X of this reaction. Tip number 10. Draw a properly labeled diagram that represents the experimental setup. Draw using simple lines. Do not draw in 3D. Do not shade. Label to the right using horizontal parallel lines and label correctly using scientific terms. Here we have our diagram. Now we have to state two variables that should be controlled. The volume of hydrogen peroxide, we realize it was 100 cm cube, and the amount of catalase and manganese oxide used, either the mass or we could use a spatula for. Two limitations, the rubber bung system may not be fully airtight causing gas to leak. The enzyme is biological material and so may not only be catalase. One precaution is to ensure that the rubber bung tubing syringe system is fully airtight by using grease at the cork and tubes. Super! Any questions? Type any questions you have in the chat. Someone will get back to you and look for other rate questions to try. Nice work. I wish you all the best in your exams coming up soon.
I know that you have been having an excellent session so far. And so in continuing to our next video, we will be looking at a question on organic chemistry. This is the question that we're looking at. We're told that organic molecules can exist as different structural isomers, and we're asked to define the term structural isomers. So in organic chemistry, molecules normally have a molecular formula, which tells us exactly how many atoms of each element are present in that molecule. Now, when organic molecules have the same molecular formula, but how the atoms are arranged are different, we say that they are forming structural isomers. So structural isomers have the same molecular formula, but a different structural formula, or they differ in how the atoms are bonded or arranged. Let's look at the second part of the question. We're given a particular molecule with the formula C4H10, and we're told that it can exist as structural isomers. And so we may remember that structural isomers have the same molecular formula, so they'll have the same C4H10 formula, but how they are arranged would be different. And in this question, we're asked to particularly draw the fully displayed structure. Right, So it must be fully displayed, showing all the bonds and how they are connected. So what type of compound is C4H10? What type of molecule is that? Because it's C4, we note that the, in terms of naming, we would have a prefix but, B-U-T, and of course it has 10 hydrogens, so we can determine the type of homologous series we're dealing with which would be an alkene. So we're looking at butane. And generally, when we're drawing structural isomers, you can draw the straight chain isomer first. So for butane, having four carbons uh, joined in a straight link and the re re requisite number of hydrogens added so that carbon has four bonds would represent isomer one, butane. Now, how could we get a second isomer? Usually, to get a second isomer, a quick way to do that is to form a branch. And we form a branch when we have a carbon that is attached to another carbon in between two other carbons. Sounds confusing, right? So in this case, if we add a methyl group, so we move one of the CH3 groups at the end and place it in the middle, we now have an isomer. And to name this isomer, we know that we are, our branch is a methyl group, CH3 group, so it's an alkyl group. And it's on the second carbon if we count from either direction. And so it is 2-methylpropane. The question continues showing us that we have two hydrocarbons, A and B and we're asked to describe a test to distinguish between compounds A and B. So whenever we're asked to distinguish or, or work out what these compounds are, we need to note the actual type of compound that we're dealing with. So we need to note the type of organic compound or the homologous series. And of course, by examining compounds A and B, we know that A has a double bond, so that would represent an alkene, and B, having only single bonds, would represent an alkane. So how do we distinguish between an alkane and an alkene? Very common test is to react them with bromine solution, that's one, or we could also add acidified potassium permanganate solution to a sample of compounds A and B. So those are two distinguishing tests. And what would we observe? In a test like that, 
the alkenes, so all alkenes, kenes would react with a bromine solution. So compound A would decolorize the bromine solution. It would also decolorize the acidified potassium permanganate solution. Whereas compound B, being an alkene, would not have a reaction. Let's continue, still using compounds A and B. We're told that both compounds A and B would burn in oxygen. And we're told to give a balanced chemical equation for the burning of compound B in excess oxygen. So let us note that the question says excess oxygen. So in, in organic chemistry, substances can burn in excess oxygen or in limited oxygen. In excess oxygen, we can produce carbon dioxide and water or steam, whereas in limited oxygen, we could produce carbon monoxide or carbon, if it's very limited, which is the black looking suit and water or steam. So in this particular equation, let us write down our reactants and the products we expect to get. So it is compound B, which is C3H8, that's a formula, burning in oxygen to give us carbon dioxide and water. And of course, we put in our state symbols. Now, because we want a balanced chemical equation, we have to now look at the number of atoms on both sides of the equation. So we have three carbons on our left and one on our right. How can we make that balanced? We have eight hydrogens on our left and two on our right. How can we make that balanced? And generally, when we're balancing equations, we would leave the oxygen for last. So to balance that, you may realize we would need three carbons on the right. Yes, four H2 to balance the eight on the left and as I said, when we count up the number of oxygens remaining, so we have 3, 2, 6, and 4, 10, means that we would need 5, O2 to balance the oxygen. Good job. Now the question continues, showing us the same two compounds, compounds A and B, and we're asked to give a, a use for each of those compounds. So it's good to recognize that compounds A and B would normally be found in the refinery gas fraction when we're, distil we're distilling or bringing crude oil through fractional distillation. So it means generally any substance found in the refinery gas section can be useful as a fuel. To be specific though, compound A, which is propene, can be used in the manufacture of a polymer called polypropene. You can see that on some of these plastics that's used for packaging and for containers. Propene is also useful in the production of propanol, very important um, chemical. Compound B is propane. And of course, we're used to using propane as fuel for our stoves, for cooking, and for heating. Now, the question continues now to using compound A, we're told that it reacts with a substance X in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid at 170 degrees Celsius to form compound D. Again, it's useful to look carefully at the structures to identify the type of compounds we're dealing with, or in this case, the functional groups. So we have compound A, which would represent our alkene, and compound D has an OH group, which would represent our alcohols. So that's the first thing. How can we convert an alkene to an alcohol? This normally occurs, of course, using the hydration reaction where alkenes react with some substance to form an alcohol. Now, if it's hydration, we could, you know, use our simple reasoning to say 
When substances are hydrated, we add water. So in this case, X would be water in the form of steam. So when we add steam to an alkene, it can be converted into an alcohol if it is done in the presence of concentrated acid. So we're asked now, what is the name of compound D and the homologous series to which it belongs? So we may have gotten a part of that answer already. Naming, we note we have three carbons in compound D, but there's an OH group and the OH group is now placed on the second carbon. So we have to account for that in the name. So compound D would represent propan 2 all 2 to show that the OH group is on the second carbon. And of course, we know that that is an alcohol or it may be called alkanol. Now keep practicing students as we move to our final topic that will be covered by Miss Kimon Sinclair on electrolysis. Hi everyone, my name is Miss Kimon Sinclair. Today we will be looking at a chemistry paper two question on electrochemistry. The question reads, copper sulfate solution is known to be an electrolyte. Define an electrolyte. Identify the ions present in copper sulfate during electrolysis. Define the term cathode. Predict which ion from above will migrate to the cathode. Write the ionic equation of the reaction taking place at the cathode. Is copper sulfate solution a strong or weak electrolyte? Explain your answer. So, as we said, copper sulfate solution is known to be an electrolyte. The first question asked us to define an electrolyte. So, what is an electrolyte? An electrolyte is a compound that forms ions when molten or in aqueous solutions and it is able to conduct electricity. So we're saying electric current is able to pass through it. Identify the ions present in copper sulfate during electrolysis. Copper sulfate is an aqueous solution and this means that the aqueous solution consists of copper sulfate and also water. The ions present would then be copper ion, sulfate ion, water would be hydrogen ion, and hydroxide ion. So these are all the ions that would be present in the aqueous solution. Define the term cathode. Now, for electrolysis to occur, it occurs in what we call an electrochemical cell where we have what we know as electrodes. There are two types and cathode is one of them, anode is the other. Now, the cathode is normally connected to the negative terminal of the battery and this will cause us to define cathode as the negative electrode. Predict which ion from above will migrate to the cathode. So remember in previous questions, we have identified the different ions as copper sulfate, copper ions, sulfate ions, hydrogen ions, hydroxide ions. So the cathode is negative which means that the positive ions, which are your cations, will migrate towards it. So both copper ion and hydrogen ion will move towards the cathode. But we have what is called preferential discharge, where the ions migrate towards it because of 
it be preferentially discharged. So the ion that will migrate to the cathode is the one that would be lower in what we call the electrochemical series of the metals. So it is the one that is more likely to be discharged. Copper is lower than hydrogen in this series. Therefore, copper ion is the one that is discharged. Write the ionic equation of the reaction taking place at the cathode. So the equation would be copper 2 plus ions, AQ because it's in an aqueous solution, and it would be gaining two electrons to produce copper solid. At the cathode, reduction normally takes place. This is why copper ion is gaining two electrons. And you can also check it to see if it is reduction because you would have a decrease in the oxidation number where 2 plus would be changing to 0 for copper solid. Is copper sulfate solution a strong or weak electrolyte? Explain your answer. So remember we had said copper sulfate is an aqueous solution, right? And it is an aqueous solution of an ionic compound. Now, aqueous solution of any compounds are normally strong electrolytes. So, copper sulfate would be a strong electrolyte. Explain your answer. So, this is how you would explain it. It is a strong electrolyte because strong electrolytes are fully ionized when they dissolve in water. Therefore, it contains a high concentration of ions. So when copper sulfate is placed in water, it dissociates or it ionizes um, and you'd have a high concentration of ions making it a strong electrolyte. In this final video, We'll take a look at another question on electrolysis with some aspect of the mole concept included. Let's get to it. Now, this is a question that we are looking at. Students in a chemistry class are required to devise an experiment to classify substances as conductors and non-conductors. They're provided with some materials, a bulb, a source of power, two graphite rods, connecting wires and substances to be tested, including zinc metal, aqueous potassium bromide, solution of bromine in carbon tetrachloride and, a, and solid potassium bromide. And they're asked this question to draw a fully labeled generalized diagram to show how the materials could be arranged to conduct an experiment to determine whether they're conductors or non-conductors. How would we go about doing this? So of course, because we're looking at a generalized diagram, we're looking at a diagram of an electrolytic cell, we would have to indicate on that diagram, because we have to label it, the source of power, which we would think it would be a battery, the wires, the substance to be tested, right and of course the bulb so a general diagram would look like this with all the components labeled of course our test substance would go at the point x and we would be connecting the wires by using a graphite rod to connect our substance to the cell and of course we would label our wires now let's see what is required in the next part of the question. So we're asked to actually conduct the experiment and record the results in a table. So the substances being tested are indicated in the table and the question says, we are to indicate the observation that the students would have made when conducting the experiment. So based on what we had, the setup we had before, what do we, do we expect? Well, when we place zinc metal as a substance to be tested, 
we're basically checking to see whether the bulb will light or whether it will not light. And of course, based on what we see, it will determine if the substance is a conductor or not. So for zinc, we expect the bulb to light. For potassium bromide in aqueous solution, we expect the bulb to also light. For, sol for solution of bromine in carbon tetrachloride, we're not expecting to see a light, so no light would be seen. And for solid potassium bromide, again, we're not expecting to see a light. Of course, in the next section, we're going to try to come up with the explanations for those observations. So the next part of the question is asking us to provide an explanation for each observation recorded before. So what would cause the bulb to light? What is our explanation for zinc metal? Well, we know zinc is a metal, of course. Metals are conductors because they, of course, have mobile electrons that can carry the electric current. What about aqueous potassium bromide? Why would the bulb light in that case? Aqueous potassium bromide is an anic solid, but in aqueous solution, anic solids can conduct electricity because, of course, yes, they have mobile ions, free to move. Now, no light was seen for the solution of bromine in carbon tetrachloride. What is the explanation for that? That solution is a covalent substance, essentially. And generally, covalent substances are non-conductors. There are no mobile electrons or ions to carry the current. Finally, solid potassium bromide is an ionic solid, so we would have expected that they would have conducted elect electricity, right? Wrong. In this case, because it is a solid, ionic solids are not able to conduct in their solid state, but because, of course, there are no mobile ions to carry the current. Very good. Now let's examine the next part of the question. We're told that during electrolysis of aqueous copper two sulfate using copper electrodes, a current of three amps was passed through the solution for 10 minutes and copper was deposited at the cathode. So our first question here is that we're to define the terms electrolysis and cathode. What do we know about electrolysis? Well, electrolysis is essentially the breaking up or decomposition of a substance by passing electricity through it. So that's our definition. What about cathode? What's the cathode? In electrolysis, we have um, Different electrodes. Now, the negative electrode is a cathode because, of course, cations, which are positive ions, will migrate towards the cathode. Very good. The next part of the question now says that we're to calculate the mass of copper that is deposited during the reaction. And we're given some information. The relative atomic mass is 6 to 4 for copper, and we're told that 1 Faraday um, is equivalent to 96,500 coulombs. So, what other information are we provided? So, to calculate the mass of copper deposited, we, we know that, of course, copper ions will be moving towards the cathode, right? So, copper is deposited at the cathode. We're given the current that was used based on the question, 3 amps and it was passed for 10 minutes. So we can use that information to calculate the quantity of electricity that was passing through the solution. And that is using the, the formula Q is equal to I times T, where I is current and T is time in seconds. So we know the, the current that was passed, three amps, that's given. And we're told it is 10 minutes, but we have to now put the time, convert that to seconds. So it would, of course, be 10 times 60. So the total quantity of electricity to pass through would be 1800 coulombs. Okay, how can we use that information? So we just were reminded that one Faraday 
um, is required, which is 96,500 coulombs, to um, allow for the flow of one mole of electrons. In this case, we were only able to um, pass through 1800 coulombs of electricity in that substance, so we need to work out how many moles of electrons were flowing in that cell. So to do that, we divide 1800 by 96,500 and we get 0 0.0187 moles of electrons. All right, that's the first part. So the question is still asking us to calculate some the mass of copper. So we have to remind ourselves when copper is deposited, it would require that the copper ions are reduced. So they gain electrons, two electrons to form copper solid. And from that, we can see that to form one mole of copper would require two moles of electrons. So it's a one to two ratio for copper to the moles of electrons. Therefore, I can work out the number of moles of copper since I know the number of moles of electrons calculated before. So if it's one to two, then the moles of copper deposited would be half of that, 0 0.0093. Still not finished. Question is asking us for the mass of copper. So if we know the number of moles of copper, we know the molar mass of copper, which is 64 grams per mole. We can work out the mass by multiplying the number of moles by the molar mass. And our answer would work out to be 0.6 grams of copper deposited. And that's the end of the question. Seems like we've come to the end of this video. Thanks for your participation and good luck on your examinations. Well, as the saying says, all good things must come to an end. Thanks for being a part of this, our Chemistry Camp series. And we just want to say, we hope that this session has been um, useful and of course, has been a help in your examinations, preparations. So, we want to um, thank you for joining us and ask that you look out as we continue to expand this Chemistry Camp series by including some sessions on Cape Chemistry. So look out and watch out for these notifications. Until then, good luck in your exams and keep practicing.